Hello and welcome to BTC Radio. I'm Kevin Mitchell, founder of the Business Travel Coalition and your host. Our guest today is Bill McGee, airline industry consumer advocate and author of a great book titled Attention All Passengers. Bill has been for a long time one of the most respected and effective advocates in the business. Today we will discuss the recent passenger service meltdowns on United Airlines, American Airlines and Delta Airlines, the resultant public outrage, the congressional hearings of last week, how the industry arrived at this point, and what needs to be done. It's a true honor to have him on the show. Welcome, Bill. Thanks very much, Kevin. It's an honor for me as well. I appreciate it. Well, let's get right to it. In the aftermath of those terrible passenger experiences, do you remember at any time that you've been following and been involved in the industry of such public outrage here and as well as abroad? No, I think this is unique. It really is. Uh, my time in the industry goes back to when I started working in the airlines in 1985, and I spent seven years working in the airlines and then and later became a consumer journalist and a consumer advocate, and I've never seen anything like what we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Somebody asked me about this on the day that I testified, and I said, well, you know, the fact is it's been more than three weeks since the Dr. Dow incident on United Airlines, and here we are having a congressional hearing. Uh, in my memory, nothing like this has happened. And I think what really underscores it is that, um, you know, in my view, it's a tipping point. And tipping points are those things that, that occur in history that, you know, we sort of know when they happen, but we can't predict them. You can't say, well, it's going to happen next week or next month. But once it comes, we know. And, and I don't in any way mean to demean, you know, larger, larger issues, but we've seen it so many times. We, you know, if you want to go historically with the Boston Tea Party or with Rosa Parks, uh, you know, it, it, what, what often happens is that there's built up resentment and something happens to sort of, you know, ignite it and trigger it. And then suddenly it's a, it's a whole new ball game. And I think that's what we have here. If, look, I mean, let's be honest, if this was an isolated incident, if this was an anomaly and Dr. Dow was this, you know, this odd occurrence that just happened once, I mean, it wouldn't have lasted on social media for more than 24 or 48 hours. Here it is a month later. We're still talking about it. Congress is still debating about it. Journalists are still writing about it. And I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because they're, you know, the, the experience with Dr. Dow, as I said the other day, we all realize it could have been any one of us. Millions of people are fed up with, you know, how the industry treats its, its customers. And, you know, now, now we're, in a, we're in a whole new paradigm. Very interesting. Now, you were the only consumer advocate to be called to testify last week in the U.S. House of Representatives. But before we uh, get a sense of what your, your testimony was, you've testified before, so you know what the, the atmospherics are like. Was there anything different this time around for you that you noticed in the hearing room? Yes, absolutely. A couple of things. First of all, uh, I have testified um, several times in the past, uh, but it's always been on the subcommittee level. Uh, this time, it wasn't the House Aviation Subcommittee. It was the uh, full House Transportation Committee. So there were dozens and dozens of representatives coming in and out. This was by far the longest session I've ever been involved with, and I asked other airline and consumer people, and uh, they all told me the same thing. It lasted four and a half hours. We started at 9.30 in the morning. We didn't finish until 2 p.m. with only a couple of five-minute bathroom breaks. We went straight through for four and a half hours. Uh, I, I don't know if every single member uh, of both the majority and, and the minority on the House Transportation Committee testified, but it certainly felt, felt like they all did. Um, they all came in. And um, I was struck by a couple of things. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the length of the hearing uh, itself, that was one thing. But also how this really cut across the aisle. I think, you know, I, I don't mean to be, to be funny about this, but I think there are very few things that unite Americans these days, you know, in both the red and the blue states and, you know, on both sides of the aisle in Congress. And I think, you know, displeasure with the airline industry may be one of the last things we can all agree on. Uh, I was struck by even those members uh, who said that they, you know, they're not, they are not inclined to look for regulatory or legislative solutions for problems, that even they were saying, well, things have gone too far and this is unacceptable. And of course, it's also worth pointing out that with the exception of the member representing the District of Columbia, just about every single uh, representative who spoke referred to the fact that he or she flies, you know, virtually every week. So they experienced this. 
Now, I didn't point out that many of them, of course, receive VIP treatment and they're, you know, they don't have to wait on long lines and they don't have to worry about seat assignments. But even members of Congress were telling their own horror stories about getting bumped, about not being accommodated on flights, about, you know, the long line. So, you know, you really have to say, uh, you know, if, if that's how, how they're being treated, what, what hope do the rest of us have? Yeah, very good point. If VIP treatment isn't, isn't very good, then we're, we're in trouble, those of us in the back. Bill, take us through the highlights of your testimony, if you will. Sure, sure. I was uh, I was speaking on behalf of Consumers Union, and uh, we have looked at these issues for many years. Uh, I'm not representing Consumers Union today, but um, what what I testified was that, in our view, first of all, on the specifics of why the hearing was called, it was specifically called because of the Dr. Dow incident with United, with overbooking. And with actually a larger issue than overbooking, which is denied boarding. People sort of conflate those and confuse them. But remember, that flight was not overbooked. Dr. Dow was bumped to accommodate a, uh, a crew member. Now, in addition to that, we have seen even public statements from airlines, incredibly enough, saying that they have bumped passengers in recent weeks due to, you know, quote, more valuable passengers. Um, you know, you would think that any service industry would never use a term like that publicly, but I think it's, it, it, it underscores just how problematic relations are between airline customers these days when they publicly say things like, well, you're less valuable than, you know, than this other person. Um, so in, in my testimony, the first thing I said was, we need to end once and for all denied boardings that are on an involuntary basis. We don't see a problem with um, voluntary denied boarding. If an airline wants to offer compensation uh, to, uh, to get a seat and somebody's willing to take money, money, mind you, not travel vouchers, because, you know, even the DOT says it should be in cash, and uh, you want to take, you know, uh, compensation in order to fly later, then that's your right, and that's fine. But involuntary denied boardings have to end. I, I cited at length four different reasons why this system that was created at the, at the dawn of the jet age in the late 1950s when consumers could overbook without penalty. This system is, 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 is basically obsolete now. There's no need for it. The airlines have plenty of tools at their disposal uh, to, you know, to, to make sure, as we all know, that they fill as many seats as possible. And passengers are penalized. You're either going to face a heavy uh, fee, which can run into hundreds of dollars, or you're going to lose your non-refundable ticket. So the risk is no longer on the airline side. All, all, all of the, the deck is stacked, stacked now in the airline's favor and not in the passenger's favor. So first and foremost, we said involuntary denied boardings have to end. But we looked at this as an opportunity to talk about bigger issues, and I spoke uh, at length about the need for meaningful passenger rights. Uh, you know, we have a model here. It's not like we're starting from scratch. It's, it's worked for 12 years in the European Union. And, um, you know, I went through a, a whole list of things that needs to be, you know, codified in, uh, in legislation. And, um, you know, among those things were compensation for lengthy delays, compensation for uh, canceled flight, mishandled baggage, again, denied boardings on an involuntary basis. We also called for other things, including uh, minimum seat standards, and uh, not just for, you know, as a comfort and value issue, but also as a safety issue in terms of evacuation with tighter seats and, and record high load factors and as a health issue for deep vein thrombosis and issues like that. Um, so we went through a whole list of things, and um, also included in that was um, the need for full and open transparency on fares and fees, regardless of how the customer chooses to, to, to shop or to book, whether it's through the airline directly or through a third party, online, offline. Um, we have to get we have to get uh, full transparency here. This has been going on for years. The fact is there's, there's virtually no transparency for someone that wants to look for a fare and comparison shop with, um, you know, with uh, the ancillary fees that the airlines are charging. So, uh, you know, we, we, we laid a lot out there the other day. And um, I think, you know, for the most part, a lot of the members were very receptive to what, what I had to say. Well, I watched all four and a half hours and the testimony was excellent. And the way you handled the questions from the committee members uh, was likewise really, really good. Um, now, you, there were four airlines, a total of five others beside you, two of whom came from United. Was there anything particularly good or bad that, that stood out from their remarks? 
Well, first of all, I thank you for, um, you know, for, for your compliments on, on my testimony. I have to tell you, it was grueling to go four and a half hours. I'd never had that experience before. Uh, but, you know, I listened very closely, obviously, to what um, the five airline executives are saying. And, um, you know, I was, very, I was very happy that in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, representatives, maybe they read my body language or just simply because I was the only, the only advocate for passengers on the panel, they called on me to respond. So I had, you know, I had, I had several opportunities to respond. And I have to be very blunt with you. I think, you know, a lot of what they were saying is the same old, same old. These are the things we've heard before. And a lot of, a lot of you know, the airline talking points that are, that are you know, echoed individually by individual carriers and, and, and by their trade organizations like Airlines for America, a lot of it goes unquestioned, you know. I mean, to just give you one example, you know, this, this, uh, this mantra that, that, that just is accepted uh, by many in, in the government and in Congress and, and uh, certainly by many journalists that, you know, we've never seen fares lower. Well, you know, I've made several points on this. Um, you know, of course, this, this standard line, fares are at an historic low when adjusted for inflation. You know, I pointed out, first of all, of course, we're not, we're not accounting for ancillary fees, okay? And um, when you compare fares to 10 years ago, well, you know, we didn't pay to check a bag. We certainly didn't pay to carry on a bag. We didn't pay to select a seat. We didn't pay for as many changes, and we didn't pay as much. Um, you know, we didn't pay for extra leg room, et cetera. So you have this apples and, in some cases, grapes comparison going on there. Furthermore, let's remember, there's a key word in that sentence about low airfares, and that is average. And what we have now, thanks to consolidation, thanks to all these mega mergers, particularly the, the big six mergers becoming the big three with American United and Delta, what we have is a situation where the, the fluctuation within those averages has never been higher. And, you know, so what you have is, you know, for, as I said the other day, for every, for every person that scores a $99 fare to uh, Florida on a, on a low-cost carrier, Trust me, there's someone else in another part of the country being gouged. And, and, you know, a lot of what was said the other day was conjecture and opinion. I mean, what I'm saying here is fact-based. All you have to do is look at the quarterly reports from the Department of Transportation, the airfare reports, and we have seen this not once, not twice. We've seen it every single time for years and years now, for more than a decade. In these reports, they, they, they managed to, you know, parse this information, and they managed to show you that route by route, carrier by carrier, fare by fare, what we see is the same story over and over again. When there is competition from low-cost carriers in the United States domestic market, we see that fares go down. When low-fare competition leaves for whatever reason, because the low-fare carrier stopped flying that route or they went bankrupt or they were driven out of business, whatever, fares go back up. We, this is not a one-time thing or, or something that's happened two or three times. It happens every single time. And conversely, on routes all over the country, thanks to consolidation, thanks to the fact that there are so few carriers now where we don't have low-cost competition, we see that passengers get gapped, that the majors, when they're either competing against each other, and I'm putting competing in air quotes here, or when they're just, you know, operating virtually in a monopoly in some parts of the country, particularly in... in uh, in rural areas and in smaller airports, there's no competition and fares are, 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 there's no way that anyone could say with a straight face that fares are at all time lows or, or, or record lows for the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And so, you know, again, I mean, I'm, I'm citing just one example. I mean, there are other examples of things that were said this week. You know, many of the, the House members were very angry about, about seating. And, you know, we heard these responses from, you know, from United and, and Southwest and Delta and Alaska, and then the very next day, one day after our testimony, American Airlines drops this bombshell that they're going to start offering seat pitch on some of their aircraft that's, that's, that's in the neighborhood of Spirit Airline. I mean, it's just absolutely absurd. So, uh, you know, there, was, there were several things where I sort of, you know, bit my tongue and was, was chomping to get, you know, to get to the microphone to refute, but many of them are things we've heard before. And I thought it was very telling that when, you know, when there were some hard questions put particularly to United Airlines over the Dr. Dow incident and questions were asked of United and American and others saying, well, what is your policy on, on how you decide to, to, you know, bump a passenger? There was a lot of stuttering. There weren't a lot of straight answers. You know, it's just one of the airline industry's many opaque policies, like, you know, like, like shoppers um, trying to uh, compare fares and fees. You know, we still don't know exactly what goes into this algorithm of why are you decided that you're going to be bumped, but I'm not. 
you know, they give you answers, but well, it's based on price. It's based on a lot of things that they're not talking about. Okay, so another thing I hear the airlines say a lot, Bill, is they train their sites on the DOT and Congress, and they say, you know, if you get involved in seat size or if you get involved in forcing us to to make ancillary fee data available uh, to travel agents or meta search information to travelers at those meta search sites, you're you're re-regulating uh, the industry. Do they have a point? No, I do not think they have a point at all. Uh, I was asked point blank by a representative the other day, uh, you know, on behalf of Consumers Union, do we support re-regulation? I said, absolutely not. We've never in my 17 years with Consumers Union, we have never publicly said such a thing. Um, <clears throat> and going back all the way to 1978, I find no evidence that Consumers Union ever even thought that. Speaking for me personally, I, I have never publicly said that we should return to nineteen pre-1978 dial economic regulation of the industry where the, the government set all fares and routes and that type of thing. Now, having said that, did I call the other day for other forms of regulation? Absolutely. Either regulation or legislation? Absolutely. And I think that, in fact, rather than that, you know, being a, 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 a in contrary spirit to the 1978 Deregulation Act. In fact, it's consistent with it. And, you know, it's one of these things, it's like the U.S. Constitution itself on issues, you know, larger than airline issues. People sort of are happy to quote it, but they're, 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 they're hesitant to read it and actually understand it. And all you need to go back is, you know, is, is look at the actual, you know, U.S. code and you look at the rules and you see that actually, in many ways, the framers of uh, the, the Deregulation Act uh, were very clear about what should and shouldn't happen. Look, they had, a, they, had a, they had a vision that this was going to be great for consumers because it was going to open up competition. It was going to be new entrants, okay? I should point out, by the way, we haven't seen a new entrant scheduled passenger airline in the United States since 2007 with Virgin America, which, of course, now is going away as it gets absorbed by Alaska. That 10-year span is the longest in the history of the U.S. airline industry. But Again, there was supposed to be new competition, and that was going to you know, lead to all sorts of good things for consumers. But there were also certain things they said they did not want to say. And, you know, number one is assigning and maintaining safety as the highest priority, period. That, we have seen that compromise. It's not a conversation for today, perhaps, but we've seen it compromised with, you know, the airline uh, outsourcing maintenance and uh, lowering pilot standards for regional carriers, et cetera. But just staying with the issues that we are discussing, you know, it's clear that, um, you know, that, that one of the goals of deregulation, as stated, is adequate, economic, efficient, low price services without unreasonable discrimination or unfair or deceptive practices. Now, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what we have now. Unreasonable discrimination, unfair and deceptive practices. When you can't go on a website and determine that a family of four is flying to Disney World and they need two checked bags, two snacks, uh, you know, four seats together, extra leg room, what have you, all of this, and get a fare and comparison shop across a couple of different carriers, well, that's an unfair and a deceptive practice right there. Unreasonable discrimination, if that doesn't speak to what happened to Dr. Dow and to, to, to thousands of other passengers every month, I don't know what does. So, in fact, you know, this, this cry that any time we say there's something wrong here and we're looking for a fix, that we're calling for deregulate for re-regulation, excuse me, uh, you know, it's false. Bill, briefly, if you can, a thought that crossed my mind a minute ago as you were going through all that, there is great profit in consumer confusion, especially in the airline industry, where people travel, majority of people travel once a year, maybe even, you know, less frequently. And, and th this is just massive confusion for them. But, right. you know, how did we get here? If you could give us the big picture, connect some dots uh, for us. Sure. I think, you know, there's been a sort of perfect storm, particularly post 9-11, you know, going back 10, 15 years to the early 2000s. Um, we have seen, uh, as I detailed in Attention All Passengers in my book about the airline industry, um, which, by the way, it's five years old now, but I have to say, I, obviously, I'm biased, but, you know, just about everything that I was writing about and predicting for the future, you know, has either come true or gotten worse in, since 2012. So, a lot of books after five years are sort of outdated, but, um, you know, uh, the reason is, you know, I was detailing these trend lines and the trend lines are all going in the wrong direction for consumers, whether you're business travelers, leisure travelers, and among them, the key trend lines, you know, let's start with consolidation. We have 
you know, the fewest number of major carriers, 800-pound gorillas controlling the U.S. market than we, we've had since, you know, since the OM industry originated, basically, in, in, in the past century. And, um, you know, so now we have, you know, the big three network, American, United, and Delta, plus Southwest, and we've never had that much concentration. So there's, you know, there's, there's all of the ill and negative effects of rapid consolidation and dramatic consolidation and all that that means, which, of course, you know, has translated into higher fares on routes, loss of nonstop flights and, and, and um, connecting service on routes, loss of flight frequencies, loss of entire hubs. I mean, we're talking about things that don't just affect individual travelers, but entire corporations and entire cities and community, you know. Talk to people in St. Louis that don't have a hub there anymore and ask them, you know, what effect that that on business and so many other hubs around the country. So we have a consolidation. We have record high load factors. Uh, you know, I've said this so many times that, you know, I feel like I'm quoting myself, but, you know, it's a fact. You can look up the statistics. And not since World War II when, you know, when the airlines were uh, troop carriers, effectively, have we seen load factors like we're seeing now. You're now cramming more people into airplanes at the same time you are Again, this is fact. This is not conjecture. Uh, you know, we're making the seats tighter and smaller. They're, they're, the width is, is being reduced. The seat pitch is being reduced. More seats are being crammed in. Um, you now have the ancillary fee situation, which we touched on before. So now we're being charged fees for things that we never were charged for before. Of course, charging for check baggage has left, you know, has led to this tremendous increase in carry-on baggage. So now you have, you know, this perfect formula for air rage. Less, less seat room, more, more crowded cabins, and less, you know, overhead bin space. All these trend lines, as I say, are going in the wrong direction. At the same time, you know, as, as one congressman I thought very well put it the other day, he said, I'm frustrated with my experience days before I even get to the airport, just shopping. Talked about the frustration of shopping and, and trying to, you know, find out a bottom line fare that's inclusive of not only the mandatory taxes, but the you know, quote unquote optional, I'm saying that in air quotes, because quite frankly, most people don't look at carrying, you know, a clean change of clothes for a trip as an option. You know, in many cases, you have to check a bag depending on the destination and the length of the trip. So all of this is this perfect storm of, of factors, you know, coming together. And then at the same time, you know, one thing we haven't touched on is as the, as the customer frustration grows, you also have the fact that, you know, consumers don't have the ability, as they do in virtually every other industry, you know, to take legal action on the, on the, on the uh, local and state level because of federal preemption and because of, you know, this, this rule that was, that, that was, you know, brought in at the time of deregulation that, um, you know, only federal courts will oversee, you know, disputes uh, with, the, with the U.S. airline industry. So you have that frustration layered on top of it. And, you know, on top of everything else, uh, I'm a consumer advocate. I mean, there was a time when I used to say things like, well, look in your contract of carrot and find out what your rights are. Well, I can't say that. I can't go on, on, on radio or television or a podcast and, and with a straight face. I'd be a very poor consumer advocate if I did, because I know that those contracts of carriage are, are virtually worthless these days because, A, they're unilateral agreements written by the airlines for the airlines and, and only for the good of the airlines. B, the language is so obtuse and filled with legalese and full of intentionally vague. And, and three, most consumers don't even know how to even go about, you know, working their way through a 78-page document. I've talked to aviation attorneys who can't figure out some of the clauses in contract of carriage. So what hope do the rest of us have, particularly those that are flying once or twice a year? Exactly. So, I mean, you know, when you talk about connecting dots, you have an awful lot of dots to connect here. Uh, again, it's a perfect storm. And these, these things that have happened, you know, we, we, we can layer on top of that, of course, you know, the, the Transportation Security Administration and, and, and the hassles of getting through airports and all of that. It's not a direct, you know, uh, issue that we're speaking about today. But when you layer it on top of everything that has to, you know, I, I simply don't know anyone these days who says, you know, oh, I'm traveling by air. Good. You know, that'll be easy. No one. And, and, and even those in the front of the cabin, even those that do have the money to upgrade, you know, they're subjected to a lot of these same issues. So, you know, there's a lot of dots being connected here. And that's why the other day when I was testifying, yes, the issue of, of overbooking and denied boarding is important. And it was, you know, it was important to express our views on that. But we looked at it as a much bigger opportunity to say, look, we haven't had a national conversation about this industry in almost four decades, not since deregulation. Time we did. Bill, before we wrap up, 
any uh, final uh, quick thoughts? Well, uh, you know, again, uh, it, it, it was striking to me the other day that um, there's so much anger uh, across the board. And I mean, if we look at Congress as representatives of the American public, which is, you know, literally what they are, then it's clear that that anger extends to all corners of the country. It extends to, you know, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans. It extends to, you know, urban areas and rural areas. This is an industry that, you know, has not done well by the consumer. And I think, you know, the very fact that many of the statements, particularly the statements from United the other day, had to do with, well, we're reexamining our policies and, you know, we're looking at these things. Well, you know, where would we be if it hadn't been for the invention of the, uh, of the cell phone camera? You know, we're talking about this because somebody filmed Dr. Dow's incident. The fact is, as I said earlier, this is not an anomaly. This is the type of thing that goes on every day. Maybe not to that extent, of course. This was, you know, in the extreme with the violence and, you know, a man getting his teeth knocked out. But the fact is, you know, airline policies are unilateral. They, they're, they're top down. You have little say. You're treated, you know, as, as cargo in many, in many ways. And so, you know, it's clear that the time has come for us to talk about these things. And, you know, the promise was made the other day, you know, that the airlines are, are supposed to clean up their house or Congress is going to do it for them. Well, we took it a step further. In my testimony, I said, you know, the fact is the airlines have had ample opportunity. And every time you bring up a, a, an issue with the airlines, as we did, as you and I both did, with the issue of uh, tarmac delays, you know, eight or nine years ago, um, the airlines don't respond. Sometimes they don't even have the courtesy to, you know, to answer. Let's not, let's not forget, there were airlines who were invited to that uh, hearing the other day that didn't even show up. So it's clear they're not going to clean house internally. We're past that stage. They cannot fix their contracts or carriage on their own. The fix has to come from outside. Well, Bill, thank you for all your uh, many insights today and for everything that you do for not only consumers in the airline industry, but the industry itself and the large companies that buy a lot of air travel. Uh, the corporate travel managers. You you really have been at this a long time, and there's probably no one uh, who's your equal when it comes to uh, effectiveness. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate it, and uh, you know you know I'm a I'm a big fan of the Business Travel Coalition and, and the work that you do. So you know uh, I, I think both of us probably have a sense that um, things are a little different now. For a long time, we were sort of saying you know saying our piece, and maybe we weren't being heard. But uh, I, you know I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, this week than I was last week because I think, you know, I think we are starting to be heard. Well, that's it for this edition. If you would like to see someone special invited on the show, email me at Mitchell at businesstravelcoalition.com. For the entire team here at BTC Radio, thank you for tuning in.